uh, January 25th, 2023 Air Quality Technical Committee meeting. And uh, why don't we get started with um, introductions and then we will uh, jump in. I'll just, I'll get started, then we'll go around the, uh, the Teams uh, link here. Um, I'm Andy Gunning, I'm the Executive Director here with the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments. Um, and uh, tell you what, I'm just going to call folks out as I see them here on the screen, and then uh, we'll go from there, uh, starting with uh, Samantha. Samantha Bailey, a Sustainability Program Administrator for the City of Colorado Springs. Thank you. Uh, Carly Bowman. Carly? Okay, we will circle back. There it is. Uh, Can you oh, hear me now? Go for it. Sorry yep. about that. No problem. Uh, I'm, I help, I support the air quality program at Peterson Space Force Base. Super. Thank you, Carly. Uh, Dina. Hi, Dina Voitak with Two Roads Environmental here supporting uh, the Pikes Peak Council of Governments. Thank you, Dina. Uh, Jared. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Jared Berner, I'm the Public Information Officer here at P PPACG. Thank you. Uh, Yarek. Uh, good afternoon. Yarek Crick from Money to Springs, Colorado, um, working with air quality data of various kinds. Super. Thank you. Uh, Judith. Uh, Judith Rice Jones, a citizen representing the League of Women Voters. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Katie. Hi there, Katie Home, Conservation and Sustainability Manager with the City of Fountain. Thank you. Uh, Kevin. Yeah, this is Kevin Shrewsbury. I'm with Colorado Springs Utilities. I'm an environmental specialist. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Megan. Hello, this is Megan Dunlap. I'm the Air Quality Program Manager for Peterson Space Force Base and Cheyenne Mountain Space Force Station. <clears throat> Very good, thank you. Uh, Jacob. Hello all, Jacob Matson, Metro Transit. I am the Operations Supervisor. Very good, thank you. Uh, Melissa. Good afternoon, my name is Melissa. I'm the Air Quality Program Manager at El Paso County Public Health. Um, I actually won't be there, Quality Program Manager, for much longer we're gonna shift that program to a new program manager. So in the future, you might have somebody else. <laughs> OK, thank you, Melissa. Thanks for the heads up. It's been good to have you. Yeah. <laughs> Super. Uh, thank you. Uh, Bill Oberman. Yes, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Bill Oberman. Thanks for having me today. I'm from the city and county of Denver, our Department of Public Health and Environment. And I'm going to talk about the Love My Air program that we have here in Denver today. Super. Very good. Welcome. <laughs> and uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Victoria Chavez. Hi, I'm Victoria from El Paso County. I'm the Transportation Planning Manager. Very good. Thank you all. Um, did I miss anybody? Anybody hop on while we were doing intros? Otherwise, we will keep on rolling. Um, next item is uh, public comments. Does anybody have any comments from the public, non-committee members on items that we don't have on the agenda? We have a lot of stuff on the agenda that pretty much covers a lot of what we end up doing anyways, but I uh, just wanted to throw that open. Okay, hearing no takers. Um, yeah, let's jump into the heart of things uh, for today's meeting. We've got a lot to cover. We're gonna have a couple of presentations. Um, and before we get into the first one, um, I'll mention that we're also gonna, we're gonna talk about the ozone advance plan um, that it was actually developed under Samantha's leadership when she was here at PPACG a couple of years ago. Um, and I appreciate folks uh, sending updates and additional items that they've been working on um, in this space around ozone and, and emissions reductions. And uh, what we might do is when we get to that item, it's going to be a, a few minutes yet, obviously, but um, maybe have uh, each of the, the jurisdictions that have submitted information so far just give a real brief update on what they've uh, what they've turned in uh, I've gotten emails I think from uh, City of Fountain uh, Colorado Springs Utilities MMT uh, Peterson Space Force Base and Shriver although Shriver I don't think is on the call today um, so I think those are the five agencies so far that we've gotten some uh, feedback on um, so we'll maybe just go through those uh, 
uh, presentations just real briefly, just give a quick uh, update on uh, the items that you've turned in and then we'll open it up for some of the other jurisdictions. Um, if you're ready to give uh, a brief update on other items that you're working on that you're still going to turn in so we can uh, claim credit uh, with EPA on on all the good stuff that's going on um, across the region. OK, so just wanted to give you a little bit of a heads up on that as we get to that um, that information item. OK. Alrighty, so back to uh, item 2B, uh, presentation by Samantha Belly, and she's uh, joined um, uh, by uh, William, I'm sorry, Bill with the City County of Denver as well. I think they're going to sort of tag team a little bit on a uh, really interesting project they've been involved with, with a smart uh, streetlight uh, program. So with that, Samantha, take it away. All right. Um, hi, everyone. You can see and hear me and see the slides on the screen. Cool. Um, I don't know who's monitoring the slides, but I appreciate it. Um, so just a quick uh, quick overview, I'm Samantha Bailey. I used to be uh, the environmental planner for Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments, working with you all in this group um, on air quality. Took over this work uh, to the city of Colorado Springs as their sustainability program administrator, and I'm going to talk about the air quality program that I'm going to bring to the city of Colorado Springs that we're actually uh, replicating from Denver, which is why Bill is here with me today. So I'm going to go, we're pretty limited on time, so I'm going to go uh, just do a very high level overview. And then if we can take questions at the end, that would be great because we have a lot of information to cover. So next slide, please. So um, I'm just going to go over uh, this really quickly. Um, I am the only sustainability position for the city of Colorado Springs, and I am housed um, in the Office of Innovation, where back in 2017, uh, Mayor Southers uh, proclamated the city of Colorado Springs to be a smart city, um, which is essentially me and my uh, team of six work together to deploy technology to solve pressing issues in our community uh, effect efficiently and effectively. Um, and a smart city wastes less, optimizes services to improve our quality of life, and spurs socio socioeconomic development while protecting and conserving the natural environment. Um, so I always get this question, you know, how is sustainability related to innovation or technology? And I'm probably the least tech position within my uh, within my group, but that doesn't mean that sustainability is not a um, is not a part of moving innovation forward when it comes to a city. In fact, it's a big, um, it's a big element in a lot of other smart cities that are throughout the country, like Chicago and LA. Um, and uh, for a, a smart city in Colorado Springs, um, sustainability is actually a pillar of one of our um, smart COS plans to move Colorado Springs forward to be in a smart city. Next slide, please. Um, this is just our mission, uh, our vision and um, our, our vision statement. Um, I thought our mission was on here, so I apologize. And like I said, sustainability is one of our pillars along with smart data. So we have a data management program so we can make data driven decisions um, on how to move the city forward along with a lot of our projects. Um, I use a lot of data um, for um, what I'm doing, ex um, especially with this uh, air quality um, program that I'm going to be setting up. We also have a partnership with Colorado Springs Utilities, um, so Smart Utilities is a pillar. Smart Services, so that's anything that um, boosts our economy. So um, one project that I have that's actually under Smart Services, but that's also considered a sustainability project that you might see in the downtown area of Colorado Springs is our Smart Trash. Um, they they are um, public trash bins that have sensors in them that uh, monitor volume within those trash bins. So in partnership with Downtown Partnership, our nonprofit that kind of uh, works with the business community in our downtown area, um, we partnered with them for this project um, to look at areas of downtown that may need um, more trash bins available so we're not just littering all over the place. Um, and then big picture with that project, um, we hope to install smart recycle bins as well as look at um, the volume in terms of looking at um, trash disposal routes. So right now, because we have a free market system, we have all of these um, um, trash haulers all around our downtown. That's kind of a blight, but it's also polluting um, those diesel emissions that we that we just love so much. So ideally, we would uh, use these you know smart trash uh, bins to look at volume to monitor um, hauling operations as well. 
And then our last pillar, smart mobility. So this includes our electric vehicle readiness plan, as well as, you know, partnering with Mountain Metro Transit um, to look at how we can not only uh, look at electric vehicles, but also look at autonomous um, and continuous vehicles as well. Next slide, please. Um, so this is, like I said, a pillar um, of um, our Smart COS program, which is smart sustainability, so that we adopt practices that incentivize clean energy, investing in our current infrastructure, and looking at projects that are environmentally responsible for Colorado Springs. Next slide. Um, this is actually not only within our Smart COS plan, but the May Mayor Southers is committed to sustainability. Um, and so within our strategic plan, a lot of the projects that I do in my position um, are a part of the mayor's strategic plan. Um, and I'm also right across from the mayor's office. So it's really uh, neat to have our executive leadership committed to sustainability for Colorado Springs. Um, I work on a ton of different stuff. Currently, um, we're drafting a sustainability action plan. So looking at the Pikes Peak Region 2030 plan that was developed back in 2012, taking elements um, from that plan, updating it a little bit and having it specific to Colorado Springs. So that plan ranges from transportation to agriculture to economic development, essentially any realm of sustainability that you can think of. We covered it. We um, hired Lotus Engineering Sustainability out of Denver uh, to help us with this plan, and we hope to have it finalized by the end of this year, which also includes the greenhouse gas emissions inventory. We were also awarded a grant from the state to conduct a waste and recycling assessment and then an action plan so we can improve our waste diversion rate. Um, I think you all are aware um, there's a lot coming down from the state, like that plastic bag um, plastic bag tax that started on January 1st of this year when it comes to improving our state's waste and recycling uh, diversion rate. So it's um, going to be interesting to see how Colorado Springs can can alleviate that overall state, those um, overall state rates, as well as um, reach the goals that are in the solid waste management plan uh, for the state as well. And then, of course, um, COS love my air. Um, so I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, um, I used to be in this position with PPACG, um, and as we all know and recognize, air quality is a is a big issue for Colorado Springs as well as the region. So I brought this work over to um, my current position with the Col City of Colorado Springs. One of our smart COS projects is um, called Smart Streetlights. So that's where um, my coworker Joshua Pace is working with utilities and a few other partners um, to install different types of sensors on our smart on our street lights um, since street lights are very um, um, applicable since they're all over the city and because we have a good partnership with Colorado Springs utilities um, we're looking at installing a variety of different sensors ranging from um, pedestrian traffic so looking at looking at um, pedestrian usage and bicycle counters um, to better understand foot traffic and what type of alternative transportation is being used throughout the city. And from there, we can take the data and make decisions on business locations or working with the business community to maybe get higher foot traffic depending on what we see. Um, so when I first started this position, I was really excited and uh, thought that adding air sensors would be would be a fantastic um, addition to this smart street lights program. So fortunately, fortunately, we had um, additional funding in the smart street lights project um, to purchase some air monitors and um, I was a little nervous when that first happened because I was really rooting for these air monitors. And then I went, oh my gosh, I have to run this air monitoring program all by myself. So fortunately, uh, I asked for help from our Denver, uh, our Denver counterparts and said, hey, we're doing this program. We've been doing it for a while and uh, you can replicate it. So um, Bill's going to talk about in this next slide um, specifically what the Denver Love My Air uh, program is. But for Colorado Springs in particular, um, as you know, you know why this is important. Um, we, I worked with our executive leadership, so our mayor was really interested in having at least one air sensor um, in each city council district. Uh, we have six city council districts, and I believe we have 10. 
So I ordered four ozone monitors that are going to go on the east side of the city, since that's where a lot of our development is. And then the rest are particulate uh, matter sensors. So we'll have a good mix of ozone and particulate matter data. So we can both look at the impacts or the emissions of ozone, as well as partnering with some of our um, groups, which I'll talk about in a later slide, at potentially looking at wildfire smoke safety. This is a pilot program because um, these uh, sensors last for two to four years. So we're going to reassess this program for the lifetime of those sensors. And I feel like two to four years is a good baseline, is a good baseline to see where this program could head. And of course, um, a big proponent of doing this uh, project is um, participating in the ozone advanced program um, that you all know about as well. But um, we hope that these sensors um, will provide a lot of education and awareness and a better understanding of our localized air quality in Colorado Springs. Um, and again, you know, I'll talk about later what potential direction we could take with this program. Right now, um, we're just waiting for the sensors. They are purchased. Um, we are using the same sensors that Denver and a lot of other front range communities use. So we can have kind of this really neat front range community air monitoring network, as well as I, it makes it easier for me to collaborate with um, the other jurisdictions and, you know, learn best practices with these air monitors. And they were at a very low cost. Um, these sensors, were less than $15,000. So what made um, that really good based on our procurement process is that we didn't have to do a competitive bed, bid and it doesn't take a lot of taxpayer dollars to do it. So I'm going to move on uh, to Bill over to the next slide. And they're going to talk about the Denver Love My Air program that we're going to replicate here in Colorado Springs. Perfect. Um, wow, thanks, Sam. That is a ton of work you all are engaged in. So. <laughs> um, it really exciting to hear about all those other areas you're working in in sustainability as, as well as air. So so thanks for that. That was a great briefing. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks everyone for for making some time for me today. Super happy to um, talk about Love My Air and, and take a little time uh, talk about what we're doing in Denver. Um, so again, my name is Bill Oberman. I'm with the city and county of Denver and I work in our public health and environment department. Uh, next slide, please. So in 2018, before we had this program, I just wanted to give a little context of what we did have. Um, you know, in the Denver area, we're actually lucky to already have had a um, monitoring network with CDPHE. Uh, we've been monitoring for ozone and other criteria pollutants, as you all know, for a long time in, in the Denver area and, and have a good network there supporting that. The drawbacks of this network and why we applied for a grant to, to start the Love Mayor program was it's not really a community-based network. Um, and we'll get into that in much more detail. But um, this network that existed in the state before Love My Air, it's really to monitor compliance with the Clean Air Act, um, with the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. It's also to monitor near road traffic, highway traffic uh, particularly. So that's not really in neighborhoods, it's not in communities, and it's not accessible real time to community members. And, and so that became a big drive for why we wanted to do Love My Air. Uh, next slide. So the Love My Air program. Uh, this program started back in 2018. Uh, it, we were really lucky to get a grant from Bloomberg Philanthropies. Um, we were one of eight cities chosen for a one $1 million dollar grant to get this get this project on the ground. At that time, we were the first ever community air monitoring network. There had certainly been researchers doing this kind of work. Um, Purple Air was still in a real research phase. If you've heard of the Purple Air network, that's probably one of the most popular nationwide ones. But um, we were also the first for sure to bring it into schools. Um, so we have had an amazing partnership with Denver Public Schools here, and it's just within the city and county of Denver boundary, as you can see in this map. Compared to that last map I just showed, now you see we have sensors all throughout Denver neighborhoods particularly, right? So that was the big, big push of this program. A lot of the seed money for this program went to just getting those sensors deployed, building a database management system um, to operate those sensors and, and get real-time uh, real data displayed into the schools and, and into people's hands. Um, 
As well with that program, it's not just technology. There's also a lot of education and outreach that we do with the schools individually, and that can range everywhere from bringing more um, information to nurses as they look for um, information real time from our center network, especially administering asthma care to many of their students. We picked high asthma rate schools. Some of our schools have 25% of the student population having some indication of asthma. Um, so, so in some of our schools, that that's a real concern, and um, we wanted to provide a lot of education about that, but also in STEM curriculums, in science classrooms, doing experiments, understanding air quality more right in their neighborhood, and th those programs all continue today too. Um, I should say one thing, our Bloomberg grant just ended in December. We're thrilled to have this program keep going. Um, we have actually a bigger staff than we had under the Bloomberg grant. So Denver is, is continuing with this program and and uh, and partners like the city of Colorado Springs is is really exciting and how we're you know expanding in the future. Um, next slide. So like you uh, in Colorado Springs, um, Sam, we're we've installed particulate matter 2.5 sensors. So why did we choose those sensors? All 40 of our sensors um, are PM25. We don't we don't monitor ozone or any other pollutant with our sensors. A couple of reasons. One, um, like Sam mentioned, these are products. Uh, particulate matter is is definitely a product of combustion, um, vehicles, uh, industrial sources, even open burning or, or wood burning, wildfire smoke. Um, all of these pollutants came. Um, into real relevance during our last program. Certainly the wildfire season in, in 2020 really saw the centers perform during that period. Another reason is it was the technology at that time that was really available. It's low cost, um, they still are today, but compared to some of the other pollutants you could monitor, these are by far more stable, uh, more accurate, and uh, definitely more affordable. Um, so, and we chose some of these particular technologies also because they're solar powered, uh, they make them very versatile, you can put them anywhere, and they they feed data through a cellular network, don't even need Wi-Fi. So, so those are some of the reasons why we chose PM 2.5. Uh, next slide, please. So what we do is we take the sensor data and then we put it into the hands and minds of Denver residents from school kids to parents to teachers to the community at large. Um, this is just one example of a TV monitor we have in, in uh, one of our schools in Denver. We have these in every school that participates in Love My Air. It takes that real time data from outside uh, on the school grounds right into the lobby of a school. And that display you see, I know it's a little hard to see in that picture, but up on the wall, that was created by the school. We asked the school, you know, how do you want to display this data? Um, what's the easiest way to convey it to your community? And so that was a really neat project. It was before my time at the city, but when that was developed back in 2018, it kind of became the platform for all the TV monitors that we have in, in these different 40 schools. Um, since that time, we've we've moved to the app space. So that's a picture of our smartphone app on the right side of the slide, and that's really trying to get that information more into the community, more into the hands of, of everyone in Denver, um, and also really be a good platform for other cities like the city of Colorado Springs to use that app. That app is there. Um, all of that technology and the thought and the design that went into that app is available for other cities to use. So we're really excited to bring Colorado Springs into that app space if they choose to. Um, you know, that app is a platform they can use to display their data as well. Um, next slide. Thank you. So here's where we are with the app. Um, you could download it today from the App Store, either on your Android or, or iPhone. Um, we are just finalizing a technology uh, very common in apps today uh, was new for us is to do push notifications. So if the air quality is poor or if the air quality is good, that's what an example of this is, you know, you would get a push notification on your phone. So this is just kind of showing a beta example of it. It is actually working today. Um, 
and we are looking forward to doing more custom messaging, especially during ozone season this summer here in Denver, um, on what the ozone alert means, what resources are available to you, and really complement some of the regional efforts that are going on by our Regional Air Quality Council, by the CDPHE at the state level, and then a lot of other partners right in our community. There are health clinics, there are um, you know, local community-based organizations that have a lot of information to provide too. So this is a great platform to really share, you know, specific information with users that keeps them engaged and, and involved in air quality and raising awareness about air quality conditions. So uh, that that's a great new step we're taking with the app and we're actually hiring a person probably in quarter two to really part of their job will just be to care and feed the messaging and the communications around that app and some of our other social media platforms. Uh, next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, super excited to have a partnership with Colorado Springs here moving forward. Um, we also have a couple of existing partners in our region, uh, Boulder County Public Health. When uh, the Marshall fire occurred in Boulder County, they quickly mobilized to share data with the similar types of sensors, PM2.5 sensors, um, in that burn area. They still have those sensors going today. They're looking at maybe moving those into a school-based system in the future. Adams County has been using um, our sensors for a while now, even when they were part of Tri-County Health District or Department. Um, and then the city of Boulder is just starting to use some Love My Air materials in their climate awareness programming. Um, next slide. The future is super open, um, really exciting landscape right now with community air monitoring. Um, Colorado Springs, you know, you guys are on the cusp of um, a really big movement nationwide in doing more and more community based monitoring. There were grants um, from the EPA. Uh, we had six entities in Colorado win those grants, and many of them are in Denver, and some of them are on this slide. So we'll be working with a lot of different entities now in the future on refining our messaging, particularly from this data. I, I say a lot that we have phase one taken care of. That is the technical aspect. We have an app, we have the sensors, we have the school-based TV monitors. But now what we're doing is the so what with people. Why does this matter to me? What does this information mean? Um, and how can I be involved in, in making it better? Um, whether that's an idling program at a school or participating, you know, at the state level um, to to advocate for better or tighter air quality rules. I mean, there's a whole spectrum of things that people can do. So uh, that space, I think, is rapid, rapidly in, um, evolving because there's been so much federal funding actually given to local communities to start these programs. So there's a lot more in that space coming soon. Um, next slide. So where we're headed, um, it's it's probably fairly obvious from from my presentation, but um, we're continuing to strengthen those school relationships we have, um, creating new partnerships with with cities like Colorado Springs. Um, we're going to keep advancing our technology in the app and even what sensors we use and what pollutants we monitor as those sensors change and those um, different pollutants become more affordable to monitor, um, and then as a topic in many public health agencies and 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 government government-wide is, is hiring and retaining staff. Um, a, a grant program is very ambitious. It's it's a lot of demand on staff. Um, we actually have a whole new Love My Air staff. People have taken other opportunities uh, since the grant started in 2018. So with this new staff, we've got a great strategic plan now, and we're really looking to, you know, how can, how can this program become more community-wide, but also reach the objectives of of your personal growth and and your goals in this new space of community air monitoring. So, um, you know, we're we're very cognizant of that and 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 using that to help retain our staff that we do have. So, that was it. Um, I guess next slide. I just um, oh, there's no question. Okay, great, perfect. So. Oh, right there. Okay. Um, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Bill. And um, yeah. I know, Andy, that we're really close on time. So I don't know if we want to designate time for questions. Otherwise, I can put, um, or you can see it on the slide, our contact information and the committee can can email us with questions. Yeah, no, this is uh, fantastic. Yeah, really appreciate it, Sam and, and Bill. Um, yeah, let's open it up to questions. I put a couple in the chat, but we can uh, defer to 
Others that uh, may have some questions they want to ask first. Anybody out there? Um, well, Bill, can, can your monitors measure um, below 2.5 microns? I've heard a number no. of programs now that those those really tiny ones are most serious in a lot of things like asthma and Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, et cetera. Yeah, great point. Thanks for that question. The, um, no, our, our, our sensors only monitor PM 2.5. Uh, there are technologies emerging that will monitor you know, PM1 or ultrafine, which is typically less than even PM1 micron in diameter. Um, those technologies, as far as being reliable data to really do a lot of sort of health-based research, it's still quite expensive. Um, oh. They're not they're not usually real-time sensors. I, I'm not an expert on, you know, where the technology is in that space, um, but I know that it's absolutely an emerging space because of the health concerns around those ultrafine particles. So that's a great question. I, th I think it's definitely an emerging topic for us, and we get asked about that quite a bit. So a great example of citizen science, <clears throat> thank you, involving the schools. And I assume the campuses, the, the higher education campuses as well? No, we actually don't have anything in higher education. You mean post-secondary? Like yes, yes, yeah. you've got a lot of, lot of campuses in the Denver area. Why not? Yeah, right. We would love to expand there. You know, we've it was ambitious to get 40 public schools involved and we'll we'll always keep exploring those partnerships. I think the best link there is we do have a a high quality monitor, not a sensor, but a, a, a almost regulatory grade near we call it near FEM regulatory grade um monitor going up at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. So that that's one area we're we're kind of pairing more with the education. Um, but yeah, always open to other opportunities. We certainly have great engagement with the academic communities at UCD, DU, CU Boulder in doing research with our data. In fact, I wanted to mention really quickly, when Sam mentioned um, just degradation of the sensors over time, there's actually just a publication recently published by a UCD professor on that exact topic. Like how long do these sensors last? How reliable are they? And we're just starting to find that out because our sense, some of our sensors have been out for about four years now. So it's at that time where it's, yeah, are these sensors still accurate? And and we're getting a lot of help from the academic community in researching those kinds of questions. Good. Uh, other questions, uh, Dina? So you turned your camera on? Yeah, I've got a couple of questions. If that's okay. Sure. Hi, Sam. Hi, Bill. A um, couple questions for each one of you. So, Sam, I think I might have missed when the monitors in uh, Colorado Springs go live. And can we get a, a map of where those are located and then um, access to the data? So, I hope the answers are, are, are soon and, and yes. Um, yes. And then, yes. Bill, <laughs> can you speak to the type and volume of questions that you receive from the public? maybe early on in the program about all of the, the notifications and what the data means and how that may have changed now. Like, have you kind of trained them that this is what this kind of, you know, um, concentration means and, you know, be worried about it at, at this point? So I'll, I'll answer your first questions real quick. So yes, I purchased these sensors last fall. Um, with the chip shortage and labor shortage and everything, um, I just heard from Clarity that they were just shipped uh, this week. So I hope to get them in the next month or so. So I definitely want them installed before wildfire season in June. Um, and then I will put a link in the chat that has the specs of the sensor. Um, as well as Clarity's website. So if you want to see what these sensors look like, you can you can see them. And then based on location, I partnered with our planning department. I asked for what they would recommend where these sensors would go based on high vehicle traffic, as well as um, areas that have low to moderate income residents. So we can uh, take the perspective of uh, addressing environmental injustice concerns with these sensors. Um, they gave me a ton of points and I'll even put the, I just made a quick Google map with all the points. Um, 
that planning suggested. A lot of them were clustered. Um, so I just picked the ones that either had um, feasibility. So if they, you know, were at a street light that the city owns, or if they were near like a school or a community center, um, I kind of picked those locations because to me, those seem to be the most feasible. But on the Google Maps, you can filter out where those pinpoints are. So I will have that for you in the chat, Dina. Thank you. Very good. Any other questions out there? Well, folks may be thinking one question I really did want to ask Sam as far as um, public outreach and raising awareness. This is going to be a great tool actually once it's in place, I think, to really kind of drive the conversation across the community about why these are out there and, and why it's important to monitor um, these for our health. But anything that you're doing in advance of that to uh, let the public know? Because one thing, just kind of jumping ahead a little bit when we talk about those on advanced strategies, one of our key strategy strategies has been how do we raise public awareness around our overall ozone issue and let people know what they can do about it to try to drive down emissions. So there might be a, a chance to maybe partner on some of the communications and and outreach, but I'm kind of curious what your what your plan is there. Yeah, uh, and that partnership would be would be great um, because I wasn't planning on doing um, like a launch before the sensors were in place because again you know i've been waiting for these sensors for a while now and so i would hate to announce that this program is happening and then not get the sensors for a little bit a uh, while longer so i want the sensors in hand before i uh, do any major announcements but we were planning on doing a social media um, and website campaign this project's going to have an entire uh, multiple web pages dedicated to it as well as um, i did reach out to um, our secondary education, so UCCSCC and Pikes Peak State College, um, they're aware and they're um, potentially interested in scaling the projects to their campuses, as well as partnering with students on doing research projects, as well as um, helping me out with some education and campaigning. Um, but one thing that I actually got um, that I was really excited and that our team is really excited, I think it's a couple slides up if you wanna scroll up, but um, Bill told me when we were talking about this presentation that they did an art competition. So if you saw that slide with the sensors that had art wraps around it, um, I think that's a fantastic idea and um, our office is really excited as well as it promotes sustainability by incorporating more public art um, into, you know, into the work that we do um, and into our communities. And I would like to do this competition before installing the sensors um, just because I don't want to, you know, take them up and down. Um, so I think that would be a good way to also kick off uh, this project is by doing some sort of uh, cool, cool art competition, which I think will make, make the project uh, fun and exciting uh, for the public. Super, that's all, that's really good, good stuff. Okay, very good. And Dina, I think put a question in the chat. For me, right? Yeah. Can you speak to the volume of public questions you received early in the Love My Air program launch about what the data means and then how it's changed four years in? Yeah, so, well, like I mentioned um, before, the monitors that we have displaying that information, sort of green, yellow, red, um, that was very much a um, public process that we came up with those uh, those colors and, and that method to sort of simply relay what this air quality data means. Um, so we, we did that early in the program. Um, we've kept it that way. Uh, throughout the entire program, those, those levels have not changed in terms of like what the bins are for particulate matter concentrations. What we did add through the program, and it's available in our app, is an AQI. So for the folks on here who have some air background, you know, that air quality index calculation is um, a calculation that's performed by the state, and it's especially relevant in Denver when we have ozone alert days. You can find it on other apps and many other apps today. It's certainly not just through the Love My Air app, um, where it will tell you, you know, here's the air quality index, and it has its own shade of color. So we worked on a, a AQI for our PM 2.5 data only, 
and it's a much faster calculation. So it's using um, EPA methodologies that are are using data that's more recent to 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 make that AQI determination than than the way that the state makes those AQI um, determinations today. So that's sort of how it's evolved since we first started the program. I'd say the biggest part is that we have that AQI calculation going on in the background. Cool. OK, um, good. OK, super. This is really fantastic information. Really appreciate it. Um, if there aren't any other questions or we could have folks uh, maybe reach out to you directly, Samantha and, and Bill, if they have any uh, further questions. But yeah, we'll definitely talk more, uh, Samantha, about outreach and uh, coordination possibilities uh, there. We're trying to really ramp up our efforts and Jared, our PIO, uh, still relatively new, six months in. Um, yeah, he'll be re he's been reaching out to different stakeholders and uh, we'll talk more about how to get uh, a group together to really kind of coalesce around how do we message uh, to the public uh, what's going on and what we can do about it? Super, really, really good stuff. Good, well, thank you. And thank you, Bill, for joining us uh, and making the time. I appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Sure, absolutely. Good, good. Uh, one more um, update presentation. Um, uh, Jacob Matson's going to give an, give us an update on the uh, MMT Zero Fare Transit Service uh, that was provided back over the summer and maybe, hopefully, fingers crossed, might be some... More action coming uh, later on in 2023. So with that, uh, Jacob, take it away. All right, thank you, Andy. Um, first off, everybody can see the presentation here, so I'll make sure. All right, looks like I'm getting ahead now. Um, so yeah, as um, Andy indicated, looking to give an update. If you recall back in the summer, either July, I think, or the August meeting, I can't recall which one exactly. I did a presentation on kind of what we were looking to do with the, the zero fare for better air initiatives. So there was a Senate bill, 22-18, um, uh, 118, or 180, sorry, that created the ozone season transit grant program. So that came available to us um, in July to apply for and was used for August free fare. Um, it was administered through the Colorado Association of Transit Agencies, which is CASTA, um, uh, were the ones that were um, the persons that we applied for with the grant. It's also a kind of interesting to note, and thank you for sending it out um, earlier this week, Andy, that there is another Senate bill regarding this same program. Uh, it was just introduced earlier this week, Monday, I believe, that is looking at making a few changes and giving a little bit more flexibility to the program. So the original, the current one that we did this last year um, allowed for us to go fare free uh, for uh, June, July, and August because those were what were identified as the high ozone months. If we read this under this new uh, bill that's been proposed, if there is a different month, different set of months uh, that has a higher ozone um, uh, issue, we could potentially look to change up and, and utilize a different set of months. That was one of the things that I kind of picked up as was kind of interesting with the, the new bill. I haven't had a chance to fully read through it yet, but I did read through the highlights of it. And that one was uh, was one of the more interesting things. Another item that was fairly interesting from the new bill is it's looking like they're going to allow a rollover of funds not used from one year to the following year. So um, that's kind of kind of cool stuff coming down with that. And we'll continue to look at that and you know the the new bill and kind of see what that means for us. At this time, we are as Mountain Metro, we are very interested um, in this program and potentially. Um, participating in again in 2023, we are looking into it and seeing what we're looking to do specifically with it. But we did find that it was a pretty good program this last time around. Um, and I'm gonna, in the not this slide, but the following slide, I'll get into some of the ridership numbers that we saw during the month of August when we went fare free. But one of the, the nice things about this uh, program in particular is that it, it, it basically incurs no cost for us. It's a zero net budget effect on the city and all the eligible expenses as are listed here, these two foregone rare uh, fare revenue and operating costs that go above our normal levels. All those were covered by the grant. So in total, we saw um, that that total number come to 534,000, uh, which you see there. And right around 100 of that was for operating costs that went beyond the normal levels. That was actually on our paratransit program, Metro Mobility. We ran uh, a normal level of, well, at the time, what we were running for services 
for uh, August, we did not go above and beyond what was in our schedule, um, which this could do if you were looking to do additional services that might help curtail some of the demand and, and get um, buses less packed full of people. Um, but we did our regular services there and it was used for Metro Mobility, which saw um, right around a 2000 uh, passenger increase from July to August. So there was a pretty noticeable jump there that we were allowed to get that additional reimbursement for. So in terms of the numbers, I won't dig you know, too deep into this and, and bore you with a bunch of data, um, but we did see, as you can see from these graphs, um, and this is just showing July to September, we've seen this kind of level off and, and kind of come back to the normal numbers we would see uh, during the, the fall and now winter season. Um, but this is what we saw right before and right after. As you can see with the fixed route ridership, um, it spiked up there um, by 39% and then came right back down to 30% in September. You know, what do the numbers say? I mean, clearly people use the services a lot more. Did people stick around that were choice riders that were maybe new to the system, which is what we're hoping to attract? We don't have, the numbers don't prove or disprove that um, in, in terms of what we're seeing here. I remember the question being asked about surveying and, you know, could we reach out to the passengers and see what their their comments were and see if they were new riders and that sort of thing. And in truth, this this last time around, because of how quick this kind of came up and we didn't have a lot of time to react, we did not go to that level. It's something we're going to look at and consider um, and for this next uh, time, time around to see how we can track that. Um, but at this time, there's nothing specific for tracking that, but it's something we definitely will um, be discussing here internally and figuring out if we can and, and are able to do that. Over on the Metro Mobility side of the ridership, as you can see, similar increase from July to August and a much, much smaller decrease into September. Um, looking historically at that though, um, our September month is a pretty high use month. So while it didn't come down as much, it's usually a higher use um, in general. So um, people did stick around um, with that, it seems like a little bit, um, but it didn't really, it didn't seem like it was the new riders. One of the concerns when when we started doing this was were people going to use our paratransit more often as an origin to destination, um, and and use that more frequently. And in August, you know, they did. Um, there was a little bit extra use beyond the norm, um, but we didn't see um, that massive hit that might have been a concern in in terms of paratransit. So what I got right here, I'm um, comparing year to year from 2019. Uh, to 2021, um, you're looking 64% higher. This is fixed route uh, comparatively with August of 2021 versus 2022. And what was kind of exciting for us is we were only 2% lower than the pre-COVID numbers in 2019. So basically during that period of time, we were seeing pretty equal ridership from what it was before COVID hit. Uh, the impact um, over Metro Mobility was not as significant um, compared to fixed route. We saw that 20% increase over 2021 and still 21% lower than COVID or pre-COVID. So that kind of gets back to that idea, were we going to see a surge in this origin to destination kind of transportation? And it just didn't surge um, to a concerning level. Now, obviously, if we did this for a longer term, there's a question of would it continue to go and would it become a problem? But for the sake of uh, what happened in August, we didn't see uh, a massive increase over and over on our paratransit services. And this uh, last slide here before I'll take questions is just kind of the combined ridership. Fixed route kind of eclipses paratransit um, in terms of just the number of ridership, as you can see. It's, um, well, if you were looking at the previous slides, it's a much, much higher number over and over in fixed versus para. So it kind of shifts those numbers that way. And it's nothing, nothing too, um, too surprising here in terms of what we're seeing. It's going to be similar numbers to what we saw with the fixed route. So, um, Actually, before I go to questions, a couple other things that kind of popped up that were concerns and just kind of throw out there as anecdotal information is there was this concern, especially on my end, because I'm, I'm here in operations of what was going to happen if it's free and we had an issue with the homeless population um, not getting off the bus at the end of the line. That was a serious concern and it was at least for this one month, um, it was unfounded. We did not have any noticeable jump in issues with that. We actually saw a obviously a reduction in the fare evasion, which is when people will come up and try and 
uh, get on the bus for free and they'll argue with the driver and, and try and make them get a, give them a free ride. That obviously went away and we didn't have the end of line issues that we were concerned about. So that was actually a huge plus for me um, during this, this program because that was one of my biggest concerns. What would we do if we saw this increase and it just didn't occur? Now, if we did it longer, will it occur? Time would tell, but at least for what we saw in August, it was a very positive um, positive outcome. I think uh, my team uh, over here in operations particularly were very happy with uh, what what came of that. So it's kind of exciting. I'm excited for this upcoming year to see what it is we, what we're going to do and what we can do um, and putting it out there. Um, and we'll see what goes on with this new Senate bill and see the changes that are made and if it has any impact on how we go about running this program again. So with that, hopefully that kind of got us a little bit uh, I don't know, on time if we were out of time, um, but uh, I'll take any questions. Good stuff. Thank you so much, Jacob. Uh, got one question, but I'll open it up to the rest of the group. If anybody's got anything first. Well, they're thinking perhaps the one question was going to be around um, capacity to take on additional ridership as far as especially as far as drivers. I know there's been a shortage issue, obviously, but if there is a surge, hard to predict what, you know, six months from now, what things are going to look like. But um, do you guys have that kind of bandwidth just in the event that there is a, an increase in, in ridership over the summer? So definitely something we'd be monitoring. I, I think that concern is lessened. And right now, um, I feel pretty confident throwing this out there. It's still subject to change. We're in the middle of a contractor change right now. A new contractor takes over February 1st. We have a lot of drivers that are in training and are looking to be coming out very, very soon. And we are hopeful, um, and I'm actually myself something of a pessimist, and I am actually very hopeful we'll start to see a lot of those services go the other way. So with that, if we're back at our 15 minute frequency on those higher usage routes, 30 minute on the kind of medium usage, and then an hour on the ones that are a little less used, I think we are prepared to handle, um, at least at this point. Now, obviously things could change. If we continue to see the service um, reductions and we don't recover from that, I think you could see some challenges with that um, in terms of you know overcrowding on buses. Um, during this this August one, we didn't really have um, significant issues with that. There were some people that had to be turned away, but keep in mind we are on certain reductions. Uh, but even those the the folks that were unable to board was not. It, it was it was something we were monitoring, and it wasn't a massive hit. Now for them, obviously, that would be a, a great um inconvenience to somebody who was waiting there but it didn't surge enough to that level but once again if we're at reduced frequencies i think that that's where a deeper concern comes up but it's always a, a question that's part of this program also um allows for that funding for that above and beyond what our current mm -hmm. levels are so we could in theory it, if this new bill is it, everything goes through as it is we could in theory go ahead and put more buses on those routes the challenge is though is what does that look like for your overall fleet? So if we're to the max in our fleet, how do we get another bus out there? How do we get a driver on it if we're kind of at that teetering edge? So there's a lot of challenges, though it looks like it's uh, it's it is something we could do with the bill, but whether or not it's something we can do is a different story. Yeah. Okay. Good. That makes sense. Yeah. Super. Thank you. Uh, Dina, do you have a question? <clears throat> yes, and I'm just going to ask it and we can come back to it at another time if we need to because I know we're at time. Um, Jacob, thank you so much for the presentation. Can you speak a little bit to um, the, the marketing campaign, the public outreach that went along with last year's August um, zero fare month? And then how that might change should you get a little bit more notice <clears throat> to to stand that program up? Oh yeah, and you hit it right on the head. The more notice is the big one. So I don't recall the specific timeline. If you asked me, you know, four or five months ago, I would. I want to say that we were. It was in July that we applied for the grant. We weren't awarded until like right at the eleventh hour. So there, you know, in terms of promoting it, it was kind of a real challenge to promote it. So this year we're going in with a lot more notice on it. Obviously we're. You know, several months out from from uh, June, and then depending on the month we month or months that we would choose, if we go for one month or more, um, we would have some time. So there's definitely we're going to be developing a, a more of a marketing campaign on this one and getting the word out much earlier. We did get some criticism um, through this uh, from folks that say it bought a monthly pass and had activated it in the middle of July or late July, and now they can't. Now they're it's activated during a time in August that's free. So it, we we don't want that. Uh, we we really don't. This this last time it was pretty much the timing. 
now that we're <laughs> looking forward, um, we're, we're hopeful we'll get a, um, a much, much better um, advanced notice on that for our passengers and, and people that use the bus. Thank you. That means there's probably a lots of opportunity for everybody here um, to try to coordinate to get the word out and, and hopefully get higher ridership um, for an, another another event this year. So good luck with that. Yes, thank you. And I would also add that, you know, as we get closer to that, when, we're, when we have more details on that, I'd be more than happy to brief this uh, this committee in terms of what we're looking at and, and what this uh, upcoming year looks like. And once we have that, I'd be more than happy to give it. Good, super. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, any other questions out there? Uh, Jason, a, a quick one <clears throat> representing the league. I noticed that in Denver they had free fares on Election Day, which obviously very much appealed to the League of Women Voters. And I noticed they also had free fares on the evening on New Year's Eve. Have you considered either of those dates? I can bring that back to the group here. Um, that's not something that I've been a part of in discussions. I don't believe it's something that we discussed, but I can definitely bring that back with our, our core group here and see what the interests are there. Thanks. And you said it was election day and evening on what was the evening? New Year's Eve. <clears throat> New Year's Eve. Given given our statewide and especially local incredible traffic fatality numbers, <clears throat> that would kind of seem like a logical positive things to do. It's a good point, and I and uh, now that we've mentioned specific dates, that reminds me. I know there was a conversation. It's been a couple of years now at the PPRT board about maybe providing enhanced or possibly. I think it was mentioned free transit service, like on July Fourth, when the big uh, the fireworks show happens at Memorial Park, and we get a lot of people just a huge critical mass trying to get in and out of that that space and other areas around that. So yeah, it might be something we're thinking about, especially those those events that happen in the summer when we have peak ozone issues going on and we have large uh, gatherings going on. Um, yeah, just something to maybe uh, think about. Okay, super. Uh, any other thoughts, questions out there? Thank you much. Um, Thank you all. And we all yeah, thank you, Jacob. I really appreciate it. And uh, Jacob's been part of our group here, so we can certainly hunt him down if more questions, uh, suggestions, whatever uh, come about for sure. So uh, yeah, good, good stuff. I'm easy to find. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good. So shifting into information items, and I think we can get this get through this fairly quickly. This is one of the key items uh, that we actually wanted to talk about today. Um, and this came about where EPA is looking for updates to the uh, ozone advance plan that we submitted uh, about two years ago now. They're gonna be looking for regular annual updates to our, our plan. So it gives us a chance to kind of check back in on the items that we've listed in the plan initially, and then also identify new measures um, that uh, we wanna include within the plan as well. And I think there's a lot of really good stuff that's happening in the region, things we just heard about um, for the first hour of the meeting uh, that we can start uh, claiming credit for, if you will, with EPA and a whole host of other things that a bunch of jurisdictions are, are working on across uh, across the region. Um, I think we were reminded that in our last meeting that we ought to really um, make sure that as we get started with conversations like this, that we really emphasize, you know, why we're doing it. We're doing it because we we want to meet um, the health standards, the pollutant standards that are set by EPA. Obviously, so the public health uh, need to make sure that we're staying within attainment to the extent we can for the emissions that we generate within our region. But there's also a huge economic component to this as well, um, where if we end up in non-attainment, you know, it's going to come with some serious economic uh, consequences. And just to reference a couple of studies that some of our peer um, regions have done uh, that are in the same boat that that we are in the Pikes Peak region, Oklahoma City did an economic impact study uh, last year. And they estimated that if they went into non-attainment, it would cost their regional economy between nine and a half billion to twelve to fifteen billion over about a twenty plus year period. Um, and that's really consistent with what we've seen from other studies from other regions that have also explored this. Uh, San Antonio, their cog did a study. They estimated between three point two billion to twenty seven billion in an impact in their region. Um, I think we heard presentations in the past from Austin, Texas on the impact in their area as well. And they've estimated uh, 24 to 41 billion uh, cumulative impact over about a 23 year period. So, you know, it comes with some serious impacts. Um, and at some point, maybe at our next meeting, we can kind of dig into that a little bit further. And um, that's something that, that Dean has been helping me out to try to get a better understanding as to 
what some of those impacts are, you know, with new uh, permitting requirements potentially and um, just, you know, new regulations that we would have to comply with uh, just, you know, based on what other regions have uh, identified so far. So um, 2023 is going to be a big, uh, big year for us. Another thing that uh, Dean has sort of discovered in some of the research we've been doing is that it's most likely EPA is going to do a if I get this right, Dean, it's a determination of attainment um, in 2024, most likely using the three-year period of 2021 through 2023 as to whether or not our region and others are still attaining the standard or not. So um, that would sort of exclude the 2020 season where we had a lot of wildfire smoke and we, where we saw it, um, an exceptional uh, events uh, exclusion uh, from CDPHE and that hasn't been acted on. And I think that's the part of the reason is that we're not sure that that's even going to help drive our numbers, if you will. So um, we think EPA is going to be looking at the time frame, like I said, from 2021 through this summer or this year to see if uh, we're attaining the standard or not. And, you know, we've got we've got some work to do. We're you know estimating that um, our numbers need to be much, much better this summer than they were previous two summers if we're going to stay within attainment. So keeping our fingers crossed that we've got um, a good monsoon season and no wildfire smoke and that we can also reduce emissions to the extent that uh, we can with the stuff that uh, that we generate within um, within our region. So with that, why don't we uh, kind of dive into the ozone advance um, plan updates. I'm not going to go through the spreadsheet that I'd sent out before, but I may have to follow up with a few um, agencies to kind of flesh that out with the, the sheet that um, EPA had sent around. But why don't we start with just real brief updates from the jurisdictions that did identify a handful of measures that they've been working on or will be working on um, here in the short term. And uh, curious what others might be able to re report out as well. Um, because we do need to report back to EPA by March 1st with all the good stuff we're doing. Um, so we're under a little bit of a time crunch. One thing I would like to do as well is update our board, the PPACG board in February um, on all these different measures and let them know, you know, we're doing what we can. A lot of this is out of our hands, quite frankly, but we are really doing what we can, um, again, with the emissions that we uh, control within, within our region. So like I said, I got updates from, I think, uh, Five jurisdictions uh, before today's meeting, City of Fountain, um, Shriver, Peterson, MMT, and CSU. So any volunteers for whoever wants to go first, just to give yeah, a quick this update. Is, yep. this is Katie, I can go first. Go for it. Thank you, Katie. Yeah, I'll try to keep it concise. So last year we received a grant from the Department of Local Affairs through House Bill 21-1253. Um, we are working with an energy performance contractor to install a solar array. It's going to be a 1.67 megawatt DC system, and it's estimated to produce just under 3 million kilowatt hours annually. So it's going to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, and it's estimated to avoid just over 2,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide emitted into the atmosphere annually. Um, so the addition of the renewables is going to diversify our energy portfolio, keep our rates low, improve our local economy, um, and then, like I said, reduce emissions of hazardous air pollutants. Also, we're doing our Energy Saving Trees campaign again this year. We've done this every year since, I think, 2018, and most people are probably familiar with it. We're not the only city that does this campaign, but we partner with the Arbor Day Foundation to administer about 230 trees to the community. They use the online tool iTree to strategically place a tree on their property. And then that tool quantifies a variety of benefits. Some of those benefits, including um, air pollutants absorbed by the trees and also carbon sequestered. And that's all I got for that. Okay, very good. Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, good, uh, good stuff. Um, any questions for Katie or volunteers that want to go next? Oh, sorry. One thing I'll add. Um, we did experience some delays with the solar array just because of receiving materials. So that was originally going to go online in October of last year, but now it's going to be October of this year. Very good. Good to know. That seems like that's a, a key theme these days, right? Um, supply chain yeah, challenges. Unfortunately. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, who wants to go next? This is Kevin Shrewsbury with Colorado Springs Utilities. I can go ahead and provide sure. our update. Sure, thanks. So, 
we did um, have official retirement of Drake Unit 6 and 7 in August of 2022. We are currently in construction of the Pike Solar Project, which is projected to be online in 2024, and that's a 175 megawatt solar field. We're in currently in planning stages for uh, battery storage systems. And um, after board utility board approval, utilities filed a clean energy plan um, that was submitted and verified by the Air Pollution Control Division and thereafter filed with the Public Utility Commission. The clean energy plan commitments um, include utilities to an 80% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. That's from 2005 levels. Um, and those emissions are measured uh, by retail electri electricity sales in Colorado. Uh, in response to recent legislation, we are in the process of developing a clean heat plan as well, which will reduce customer natural gas usage. We um, are committed to retirement of the Ray Nixon power plant by December 31st, 2029. And utilities uh, also provides water and energy education classes to both youth and adults um, through our Mesa Conservation Center, as well as our programs in local schools. Uh, we have partnered with the Energy Resource Center to retrofit homes through the Home Efficiency Assistant Program. And we also offer rebate programs for the installation of energy efficient appliances to include water heaters, furnaces, HVAC systems, heat pumps, um, installing insulation in homes, installing smart thermostats, and for um, energy efficient applications in new homes. We've also participated in the Builder Incentive Program, which provides incentives for new home construction that exceeds the minimum code standards. And uh, last update we have currently is that Utilities also offers the Green Power Program, which is a voluntary program that allows customers to designate up to 100% of their monthly electric use to be generated by solar energy. Um, that program is currently um, maxed out, so we have 100% participation in that program um, for the energy we have available. Uh, and then we, we are also updating our integrated resource plans, and so we can, we'll probably maybe have some additional plans on what additional resources we may have coming in our planning processes here um, potentially even prior to um, this being due to EPA, so we can hopefully we'll have a couple more updates coming. Good, very good. That sounds good. Appreciate it, Kevin. Um, yeah, if you've got anything else uh, that you guys want to throw into the mix uh, that we can report on by March 1st, yeah, just uh, let us know for sure. Good stuff. Good. Any questions for Kevin? Otherwise, we will move on to either MMT or Peterson, if they're still on the line. I can uh, knock ours out here for uh, Mountain Metro. Oh, okay. So um, just a couple of projects here. I don't know if they all apply technically for the, the, uh, the inclusion of the plan, but I'll be glad to answer any questions to, to get them in there. Um, so the, the big one we got around here is our Metro Rides program which includes our van pool, car pool, school pool, and bicycle locker rental programs. So those provide alternate our alternative travel options for people in the region. And I think, you know, kind of the thing that what I sent off um, regarding the van pool program is it's not just impacting our region for the better, it impacts other regions too by um, the van pool program is, is basically multiple people in the same van versus everyone driving individually. And our van pool does go to Denver and the Pueblo area. So it does kind of help even beyond our region. Um, 
The second item uh, that our, our general policy right now for low and no emission buses is that we will pursue the purchase of these um, when grants are available that are specific for those purchases. So we do have a grant department here that does look into that stuff and see what's available. And when those fundings become available, we will pursue those. Um, and then lastly, um, in 2024, give or take, um, right now it's estimated 2024, we're looking at replacing six of our diesel buses with hybrid buses. So it's not the no emission, but it's the low emission um, there. So, um, and then of course, just kind of anecdotally, um, we do have our current pilot project with our four battery electric buses, and it's something we're monitoring as well. And there's always the potential for us to purchase more of those once again on a grant available basis. Um, so that's kind of what we got here. Thank you. Good, good stuff. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. Quick question for Jacob. Um, sure. You said you were going to replace some of those buses in 2024. Is that before May of 2024 or when in 2024? You know, I'd have to check with our um, our fleet on that because I am not 100% certain the exact timing of 2024 uh, when those okay. get replaced. Is there, I know in the email that was sent out, we were looking for stuff in 23 and 24. Is there a specific cutoff we're looking for? Uh, I got clarification on that. It's it, they're actually looking for federal fiscal year uh, projects. It gets a little bit confusing because I had a couple of different uh, time frames in the the spreadsheet that we had sent around. But um, uh, da, da, da. let me dig back into that, and we'll uh, give you some uh, feedback as far as uh, what what the cutoff is for claiming credit for for projects that might be coming. Sounds good. Then I can dig in on our end and find out if it kind of falls into that time frame. So mm -hmm. sounds good. OK, thank you. Very good. Thank you. OK. Um, let me see, is Megan still on line from Peterson? Would you be willing to give a quick update? Yes, absolutely. Sure, thank you. OK, so um, for Peterson and Cheyenne Mountain, since we are one in the same now, um, we've continued our ozone outreach. We've just expanded on this. Um, the main thing is uh, we have our Right Start, pro right start Program, um, which is for every single new employee at Peterson and Cheyenne Mountain, whether they are active duty or civilian. They are briefed and we give a, a small briefing about ozone, um, ways that they can prevent it, you know, tips and tricks, um, as well as websites that they can use to get updates. Um, we also have meetings at um, different different levels, so different uh, types of leaders get to hear what we're doing um, in terms of the air world. Um, so that's always ongoing. And we also uh, celebrate Ozone uh, Week, Ozone Awareness, Awareness Week. We sit out at the BX and hand out pamphlets and swag, if you want to call it that. Um, and we've estimated that we've reached over 5,000 individuals with um, with outreach over the years. Um, secondly, we continue readiness testing. So a huge part of a military installation is our emergency generators. So we work with our power production guys and make sure that they are running the generators to do their maintenance and testing in the morning. Um, that way ozone is not being warmed. Um, and then lastly, one of the, in my opinion, one of the biggest things that has started is Cheyenne Mountain got a wildland fire team um, and they have been doing some great work out there um, and they've removed approximately 27 acres of 111 acres of um, dead dead trees, you know, that type of thing. That way uh, wildfires will not be as big of an issue out at Cheyenne Mountain. So all in all, that's that's what we're doing. Very good. Thank you, Megan. Um, yeah, and I really appreciate you bringing up the wildfire work that you guys are doing because that's uh, critical. And I think that's something that we could emphasize um, in some other jurisdictions as well. Obviously, the city of Colorado Springs uh, voters approved uh, retention of revenue to do wildfire mitigation. That's something that my agency is kind of starting to now get more involved in uh, with as well to reduce uh, um, wildfire risk, uh, especially around our military installations. Um, so yeah, that that's a big one, but those are all really uh, really good uh, points. Good. Um, Can I add one more thing? Sure, of course. So this isn't in um, our update right now, but hopefully it'll be next year. 
um, Carly, my, my counterpart, um, she did a lot of awesome work um, trying to get like a an entire a mass alert uh, for a base wide, you know, when uh, when ozone alert days happen. Um, so she has worked with our we call it ad hoc. Um, they were not as receptive, but uh, I know that she's working with PA and of course she could speak to this um, Carly if you want to step in at any time, but I just wanted to shout her out that she's doing a great job. And if we gain any traction from that, we'd be happy to share it with other military installations. Super, very sure. good to hear. Yeah, Carly. Yeah, uh, I was actually going to reach out just to see. Um, so yeah, as Megan said, they weren't as receptive for it. Uh, so if you know of any maybe regulations that the state or county may actually have, if there is any type of air pollution episode issued, uh, if you could maybe forward that on to me, um, just so we have a little more of a justification and why we want to do this. Okay, sure. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I'll, Dina and I will put our heads together and um, yeah, we'll hunt down what the requirements, what the regulations are, why this is, how this is being originated and uh, sure, we'll get that on to you. Good. Okay, super. Um, okay, very good. Uh, not to put other jurisdictions on the spot, but uh, we'll need um, kind of other updates, other projects, initiatives that you're working on. And I think there's, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there, whether it's, um, you know, the city I know wrapped up an electric vehicle readiness plan. We did the same thing. We did one a electric vehicle um, infrastructure study here at PPACG. I think initiatives like that will definitely want to um, list out and just a whole host of other things that uh, our jurisdictions are working on, whether it's wildfire mitigation work, um, I know Fort Carson and others have instituted telework policies. I don't think we have anybody from Fort Carson on, online today, um, but there's a whole host of other things like, like this. I think we should uh, try to capture in our report back to back to EPA. So um, just kind of putting a bug in the ear of uh, folks like uh, Victoria and Samantha and, and, and others within your respective jurisdictions, if you can think about things that we could work up and uh, also um, identified, that would be super helpful. Yeah, Jacob. Yeah, you, you had mentioned something I actually meant to bring up as well. Um, so with the ZEV um, readiness plan and the transition, I know we're working on that uh, jointly with PPACG on the 2050 update. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have what you need for that or should you get something from us here at Transit to add into that for the Ozone Advance Program? Or do you think you have what you need I will check in with uh, John and our team and see if we're good there. Um, but if we need to follow up, uh, yeah, we'll get back in touch. Sounds good. Thank you. Good to know. Thank you. <clears throat> um, reminds me as well, I was going to mention that, you know, with our long range transportation plan update, this is looking more futuristic, obviously, but we have to comply with the new greenhouse gas emission reduction targets that were set by the state um, in 2021 when those uh, reduction uh, targets were approved by the State Transportation Commission. So there's a lot of crossover, obviously, with that planning and things that would maybe impact us in the ozone um, sphere as well. So uh, we'll put our heads together and figure out how we can, you know, report that back to EPA as well. There's just a whole lot of uh, co-benefit uh, planning that that's happening as well. Um, and I know, I know Dina was going to take a look at other initiatives at the state that we're having to comply with. Um, whether it's stuff that's coming down the pike, like uh, uh, the new truck uh, rulemaking uh, that, that's going to be uh, going in front of CDPHE in um, April that we're all going to have to comply with at some point. Um, I'm not sure what the target dates are yet for that, but there's a lot of initiatives out there, whether we love them or hate them, that we have to comply with, and that it is going to help in, in, in some form or fashion with emissions reductions, and we shall let EPA know about those as well. Okay. Um, Anything else we need to add at this point around that, Dina, do you think? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I think there's, there's a lot more that we could, but we have just a, a short um, period of time. And so I just want to respond really quick um, to um, Carly's request and just put a plug out there. I know you're looking for regulations. I think um, it's really important to highlight that 2023 is a critical year in determining whether or not the area is going to attain or not attain ozone standards. And so the more you can do on a voluntary basis to avoid any um, 
potential regulation that would come, I shouldn't say it's potential. If if there's a potential non-attainment designation, there will be more regulations coming. And, and um, I think the point is to try to avoid that. I will say that the state does put out a three-day advanced day uh, notice uh, forecast of high ozone for the area. And I would strongly encourage um, um, anybody to sign up for that. We can try to get the, the link or the email to sign up for that. And really on those days, um, those four forecasted high ozone days, try to take steps not to do things. And so I think there was an example of maybe uh, of testing engines and only doing that in the morning. Well, that knock still sits out there and kind of cooks and does create ozone. So maybe on a forecasted high ozone day, maybe delay it for two days. And I know you're military and so that's not always possible, but where it's possible, try to take steps to do something different on that day. And I know it takes a lot of coordination, but again, this summer is very critical in terms of um, ozone values. And so anything that we can do in terms of marketing um, to get people to change behaviors um, or do something different in terms of transportation or the way they can conduct business, um, we need to really try to do that. Good points. Thank you, Dina. And that's what uh, that was really kind of what I was going to sort of wrap up with as well as uh, a couple of the regional strategies that we're going to be pushing and was going to report out to our board um, in December. We've talked about these before, but two big ones uh, that we're going to really lean into is um, making sure we're coordinating on outreach and education with our community, with residents and business owners to let them know what they, they can do. And I know J Jared has been starting to do some outreach with uh, public information folks and other communications folks, and you're going to see a lot more around that um, here in the coming weeks and, and months, because we really want to see how we can coordinate around that and just, you know, just raise awareness around what are the small steps um, that folks can take uh, on their own to help us uh, reduce emissions. So much more to come there. And the other item is um, this ties back in with a lot of the stuff that Jacob's been talking about, but uh, we're going to be coordinating, getting in touch, hopefully very soon to see what else we can do as far as travel reduction, especially with our major employers and um, inform our employees at major employment sites um, around different travel options they have for getting to work, whether it's transit usage, setting up van poles, car poles, uh, em embracing work from home at least, you know, a day or a couple of days per week, you know, things like that that can help us as far as peak hour congestion, which will also help us as far as um, emissions reductions. Um, so we're hoping to work closely with uh, MMT and the Chamber of Commerce and, and other stakeholders to see how we can really get the word out around um, around those options as well. So given what Dina was mentioning, that 2023 is a big year, we thought those were two kind of big things we could really lean into initially and hopefully move the needle a little bit to the extent uh, that we can control some of these uh, impacts within our, our region. Um, so those are going to be two uh, high priorities for, for this year. Um, anything else for the moment? Other strategies that we ought to consider? Things that you're working on within your respective jurisdiction that you haven't shared that you want to let us know about? Okay. We kind of threw a lot out at you today with uh, two really good presentations, updates, and then the conversation here about the, the ozone advance plan. Um, like I mentioned, uh, we've got a little bit of time, but not a whole lot to get our final, final stuff together to report back to EPA. One conflict that we do have in, in February is that uh, I've got a hard conflict with the February 22nd uh, date, which would, would have been our next meeting date for, for this committee. So may have to skip the month of uh, February. Um, I'm sure that breaks everybody's hearts, but um, what we'll need to do is uh, if we can promise to, if you've got some other projects, initiatives that you need to report from your jurisdiction under the ozone advance plan, if uh, folks can get that into, into us um, in February, but not too, too late, that would be super, super helpful. Um, and maybe we set uh, the meeting date that would have happened in February the 22nd as the due date, if you will. Um, and I'll follow up with um, kind of an email blast uh, to let folks know what we're looking for again um, in that regard. So does that sound does that sound OK? I'm assuming everybody's head, nodding their heads yes behind their. Behind their cameras. OK, very good. Um, 
anything else for discussion? Anything else others wanted to bring up before we break up here? Okay, hearing nothing. Thank you so much. Covered a lot of ground today. Really appreciate everybody's time. I know we went much longer than we normally do, but uh, this was uh, really helpful. So really appreciate it. Um, what I'll try to do is we'll put together the stuff that's been submitted by the five jurisdictions that we mentioned so far, uh, or the three jurisdictions and the two military installations and blast that out to everybody. And then um, others that can add to that with other initiatives within your respective jurisdiction. Um, that would be super helpful. We can maybe use that as a working document. Um, so more to come on that. Um, but like I said, we don't have a whole lot of time, so would appreciate your, your feedback sooner rather than later. But with that, I think we stand adjourned. So thank you very much. Appreciate it.